Hello, Brandon. Hello, hello. I thought I, I was going to have to kill you. I know you're jonesing. You. Why? Yes, I've been jonesing. Well, I thought I was going to have to kill you because I've been wanting to get this going like three hours ago. And you just stalling and stalling and stalling. And I haven't been this excited about a card in a while. I'm actually really excited I, I know, about it, this card. It's literally insane. You called me and said, hey, can you teach Nogi? Uh, you know, can you teach class so that you could abandon your fighters so you could watch tape? What's the deal? Well, Who are you so excited about? Actually, I, your good old I friend Dom Cruz. Well, yeah, of course. I've known Dom since he was a Nino. Um, no, was, I was actually out of town all weekend, and you know, it wasn't a horrible, you know, night of fights and stuff like that on the on the Patreon on my picks. I did you know pretty well. I got most of them. Got a couple wrong, whatever. But I just I was out of town, and then I just want to smash this card. I didn't want to phone it in. Your family I drove you nuts, so you were like, "Hey, I got to throw back into the uh, to the fights." Well, it's funny. I was actually home yesterday watching film, and my kids were insane yesterday. Holy heck! They got a bug where they were just going to be obnoxious all night. And I'm looking at my wife, and I'm like, "How do you do this all day? Like, how do you handle them every single evening?" I was like, "I, I thought I wanted nights off, and clearly I don't." <laughs> like, no, I'll no. take extra classes. Let me teach more. Yeah, let me teach more later every day, weekends, Sundays. Um, man, that was that was wild. But anyway, I got a ton of film done. Um, it, what's funny though is I actually didn't watch. I, I watched film on, on everything there was. And you asked me about uh, who was it, Angie Hill and Lupita, and I was like, yeah, that's the only fight I didn't watch film on. <laughs> so I didn't. Wow. But it, th there is actually another fight that I did not watch film on, but intentionally. I'm going to kind of throw this out here and we'll talk about it later. But Gerald Mearshart, Bruno Silva. Do you know why? Um, oh, I don't want to be like an asshole, but I, I think like it's easy. Like you didn't no, need go to. For it. It's just a waste of time. I mean, it's just a waste. Of, to me, it's a waste of time. I mean, why? Yeah. Why would you need to? Like, exactly. Like if like Bruno Silva should murder Gerald Mearshart. And if he doesn't, then there's nothing that you or me or anybody else can do. Because if there ever is a sure thing in MMA, that's what it should be. Um, like e even more so, – which okay, this is bizarre. But, you know, Jordan Wright is Jordan Wright and he's – you know, he's Jordan Wright. And Mearshart is more skilled than Jordan Wright and almost – whoa, all right. We're back. We're back. Toasty. That's how you know we're we back. We are back. Cheers. I'll see you in. Man, it's a good day but when, Gerald when we're both better drinking – <laughs> Both drinking the cello. We got a little more film study than usual. I, I, I had been in a rut these last few weeks trying to watch film, trying to get through it. And weirdly, this card was the one I was like, all right, I like this one. I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So I was kind of right there with you. Yeah, but you're talking about Mearshart. Mearshart is Jordan Wright. Like, Mearshart is more no, Jordan he, Wright than Jordan Wright is Jordan Wright. He's better than Jordan Wright technically everywhere. He's a veteran. He's got a lot of amazing wins. And weirdly, I was way more nervous for my money on uh, the Jordan Wright fight than I am for the Mearshart fight. Well, you should be. I mean, if man, Bruno Silva could slip in a banana peel. He could. Who was it that got their toe stuck in the cage and it snapped off? Uh, Rick Story or something like that. Uh, I forget if it was Story or who a few years ago, maybe against Cowboy. I mean, some weird stuff can happen. But man, I, I do you? not see Mearshart. Yeah, he could get DQ'd. He could knee him in the head. I, I, I mean, on the ground. I don't know what can happen. But weird stuff can happen. But yeah, that one I did not watch film on. Not for time or anything. I got to it. And I was looking at it and I was like, no, I don't have to watch we've film We've been over on these this. enough. Yeah, we're, we've been here. Yeah, enough. and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I'm not watching film on that one. Other than that, man, I like this card. Uh, I like it for betting. I like it for interest. I like the card. I like that it's, it's in it's San fun. Diego. Yeah, it's insane. Exactly. Like, I, I don't know why that's more fun than it being in Vegas, but it's more fun. And I'm with you. The last few weeks, I've been just like a little, like, f film has been a little labor. You know, it's been a labor of, of sorts. And on this one, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching the film. I know a good amount of the people, but it was fun watching them back and kind of seeing stuff and stuff made sense. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm going to be right on everything, but I, I liked the film. I liked what I saw. I liked analyzing it. And, and, and it was just fun to do it again over, you know, we do it every single week. And this was a fun week to do it. I like your shirt. How about that? 
I'm glad you do because Kindle hates this shirt more than anything. And I'm surprised uh, you had time to watch the film with uh, with winning your your bowling league. Oh man, bowling 300, son. This is one of my favorite shirts. Sexy crevasse. Well, yeah, a little crevasse. You could fall down it. You know, you never know. Um, You know, I've got. I think, yeah, there's even like hair. I'm like in 1970s. I'm like a 1970s like cool guy with a bowling shirt on and chest hair hanging out. This is where I'm at. When you hit 40, Brandon, that's what happens to you. I'm 40 and I wear bowling shirts. And uh, for the record, this is a scotch and soda bowling shirt. So it's... it's, Ooh, I do have a couple scotch and soda shirts. Yeah, that's that's a quality brand. How did you manage to choose the worst shirt of the best brand ever? Well, first of all, That's I have like feat. 500 scotch and soda. Like all of the money scotch that we get soda. from anything, I, I just spend on scotch and soda. Um, say that five it's times not cheap. fast, scotch and soda. You no, know, I can't say it one time fast. But uh, yeah, it's definitely my, my new favorite clothing brand. It used to be Ted Baker. And then everything I bought from Ted Baker shrunk the moment I – like you walk outside in the rain and an extra large – t-shirt turns into an extra small t-shirt and is you know you threw away 180 dollars and which is why i have half of your ward literally half (laughs) of your wardrobe is all of your old clothes that you gave to me when i was too poor to buy my own when they shrunk happy happy birthday i got you five ted baker shirts that i've had for three years yeah you're like wait didn't you have that one i'm like no yeah i had this one (laughs) i I might be too fat now to fit even those ones anymore Oh, Look you're two sizes bigger than me. I know. <laughs> oh my God. I'm, I'm less concerned with your face and more concerned with your stomach. I saw you training cool. today and I was like, what the hell happened? I figured like I would bulk up like a little bit, you know, people try body shots on me and I figured I needed a little more protection. So that's, that was my game plan. I like it. I like it, man. You got to add a buffer, uh, man. So we've got a card, a good card. Um, and this card is actually in addition to being brought to us by Lemoncello, it is, we're in the final moments of uh, getting all the details of our bet online, um, you know, deals. So this card is brought to us by betonline.ag. And man, I was just looking up, I was pulling up the the lines just now and they have every line on the freaking planet. I mean, they've got every MMA fight card. They've got a hundred props. They've got a hundred, like if you want to bet MMA, Bet online, and I'm not saying that because they're sponsoring us. Like, go, go check them out. BetOnline.ag. Go look at the lines, look at all the cards that they have, and you'll see a, a ton of them. But um, this was your first time? Go ever check them going out on the website that's sponsoring us. <laughs> like yeah, it. exactly. No, but but there, like, <laughs> I, I was just going to pull it up really quickly, and it was. It took me a second because I, I actually clicked on martial arts uh, on mistake instead of MMA. I was like, wait, what is all this martial arts stuff? Who are these people? And they had that. And I was like, oh, MMA right below it. And they have every line there is. Um, so this this card is brought to us by Bet Online, And then, uh, you know, hopefully I have the links and everything. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes for this week uh, if I get them in time. And then you guys uh, also check out our my memoir. I was going to say our memoir, like you and I wrote a memoir together, but we didn't. Check we out my memoir. We Yeah, I mean. You, you I know have, I made I it in there somewhere. You're on there somewhere. And, uh, and then, you know, check out the Discord and the Patreon as well in our show notes. And before we get going, like our video, subscribe, share, tell all your friends, tell your parents about us. We're people that you would talk to your parents about. Um, so the first couple fights on this card are actually like leftovers of last week. And now that they're actually here this week, I think I don't want anything to do with them just because... Like, well, let's, I mean, let's it, talk about that because that's okay, a big topic. And I want you to address something um, just from a, from a professional standpoint. I mean, you do this all the time. So um, first thing I want to, I, I want to talk about, you know, we can fill this time because we've already gone over Lipsky and we've gone over Wit and Quinlan and all this kind of stuff. But um, okay. So I cut weight, what, a few weeks ago, you couldn't tell it now by looking at me, but a few weeks ago, I weighed in at 124.7 pounds. Now I'm 150 pounds. So three weeks I put on 25 pounds pretty easily, but I felt like death on the scale. I, I, Oh, like it was an easy cut for me. Like it was an actually really easy cut, but of course you feel like shit. You feel horrible. I couldn't stand up straight. I was hunched over. I'm a pretty big flyweight. I mean, uh, even tonight on, on contender series, there was a kid five foot seven. I'm five foot seven and I'm more filled out than that kid is. So for me to make weight is tough. Um, 
felt horrible. You know, if people were watching me, they'd be like, mm-hmm. okay, bet against him, bet against him. He looks horrible on the scale. And then you gave me the, the, the re the reload from like the UFC PI or whatever kind of reload that, that you offered me. I couldn't have felt better the next day. Like I've had a lot of, I've had 10 fights now, right? I felt good in some, I felt bad in some, but this is the biggest I've ever been in my life with the easiest cut and the best reload. It didn't feel like I ever cut weight in my life. So that'll lead us, I guess, into the first fight, Ariane Lipsky, who last week got, you know, put in the hospital with weight cutting issues. She missed weight, all this stuff. So with the science that's out there, with the UFC PI, with the reloading, how much of a factor do you think that plays into this fight? I, I mean, is it life or death? Is it last week we love Lipsky, this week we hate Lipsky? Or is it, you know, it's so good now we're good? No, the the thing with that and the thing with cutting weight in two weeks in a row. So first of all, if Lipsky had fought last week, say she wins, and then she goes and fights again this week, all right? We'll just hypothetically, no weight cut issues. That alone is a big deal, cutting weight like that two weeks in a row. Traumatic. But then... Yes, but then she missed the weight and had to go to the hospital. And the thing is, is that we don't know. And I mean, did she actually have to go to the hospital because of the weight cut, because of the reload, um, because of a hundred other different things in there? Was During the weight cut, was there high protein in her kidneys? Was it a, a imbalance of sodium and potassium? There's all of these variables that we don't know. Could it affect her? Yes. Could it, she be fine? A hundred percent. Like, I, I don't know what the details are and everybody is so different. You get some people that have a hard time cutting weight, miss weight by a pound and have the best performance of their career. And then you have Julio Arce. The sa- exactly. And then you have somebody the very next week, miss weight by a half a pound and have the worst performance of their career in the, the, the big thing is I don't know. And when I don't know, I don't want to touch anything. So it's. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's something. Maybe it's – this is just one of those that like sit it out. What's the point? It, it's Ariane Lipsky. It's Priscilla. like And uh, I, I just don't know what – if you just love this line for whatever reason, I would just keep whatever your thought is on the line. But I am just like – I don't know what's going on here because weight cutting is weird. It is not a science. Anybody that tells you it's a science is selling you something – it is not, man. It is art. And if anything, it's a black demonic art that we just figure out somehow. So yeah, there's a million variables and they all lead to none of us have any freaking idea. Doctors don't know. Like you could ask a doctor how she's going to do. One of them will say poorly. The other one will say she'll be fine. And I don't know. Well, so uh, the fight's at 135, right? So they're they're at least taking off 10 pounds of the re-weight cut. So I guess it depends on how big each of them is. The weird thing is, I mean, I, I guess if you had Priscilla and you were like, oh, zombie girl's going to walk her down and she's going to suffocate her, you got to be feeling good about it, right? If you had a bet open and if your book you know, didn't refund you or whatever. But it's weird because the line is still, it, it's grown higher, I think. She's minus 190 now of last week. And then I guess the other thing, this is just interesting in perspective. Last week, this seemed like one of the best spots on the card. We were loving it last week. And this week, we're like, no, 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 no. Don't touch it. Sit it out. Just, just nope. let's take a look. Because there's better spots, you know, this week. Well, the other thing too, and this is a weird thing. Everybody thinks, you know, Ariana Lipsky was the one who had the issue. She could have had just a virus and the weight cut, cutting down just was weird and interactions. You don't know, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. It's like there's marathon runners, okay? And a lot of them will, not a lot, but you hear of them dropping dead because they just had like a little virus, which is very benign, but you go run a marathon and it's a major thing. You know, it could be something like this. It's, she could have just some sort of a little virus, a little bug, benign, but then you get involved in a weight cut, whatever. But on the other side of that, we don't know what Priscilla's weight cut was like. How was she going to handle two weight cuts in a row? Lipsky could look a million times better. Priscilla, Priscilla could look worse. We just don't know. Um, like... Man, I it's an added with variable. betting. That is it, man. With betting, you like you guys see us talk about the different fights on this card. There's what 12, 13 fights. We're gonna say, oh, we think Priscilla wins, we think Lipsky wins, we think this and that and this and that. But that doesn't mean we're betting on them. We want to bet on who we think is the surest thing. And when we have a variable like this, it's kind of like the next one coming up, Jason Witt as well. With those weird variables, like why mess with it? Like you want to get as much information as you can 
bet based on all of that information. And when information gets put in that you can't quantify somehow, it, it, like bail, bail, bail. Well, okay. Let's. I, I guess just for the people who didn't watch last week, all of our new viewers, thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, in a vacuum, who wins this fight? Um, man, I, I would say I, I still think Klipsky. You know, just because I don't know if the if the weight cut did anything at no, no, no. all. In a vacuum, and who wins? Yeah, I'm saying I'm saying uh, Lipsky. I don't okay. I don't know the details on it, so I can't take that other stuff. I can't take the um, all of the other variables that we don't know and put them in. So I have to exclude them and just yeah. say I think all things excluded. Skill I think for Lipsky skill wins the fight. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Me too. I think Lipsky wins. So next up, we've got Jason Witt and uh, Josh Quinlan. And this is a weird one because Quinlan was suspended for um, performance-enhancing drugs, PEDS, a while ago after the Contender Show. Didn't fight. Now he comes in. And what was it? They found traces of metabolites in his blood. What was it again? Something weird. But now they're letting him fight. They must really love him. It's a weird one. You got to go, how does that affect either of these guys cutting again, making weight? And then what I really wonder is, on a mental level, does that mess with Josh Quinlan? Is he going, man, I got to win this now? Is it added pressure? Is it not? Does he care? Um, again, skill for skill, I think um, I, I think that's actually going to benefit Quinlan um, because Jason Witt's chin – is so questionable anyway. You put two cuts in two weeks in the mix, and all things considered, I don't think that helps wit, but I think it would I think Quinlan, who is younger and, and fine, I think it would I don't think it does anything to Quinlan, but I think wit, the the two weight cuts in two weeks, I think is a thing. And uh, again, man, skill for skill, I think wit is just so much better. But if you give Quinlan 15 minutes to touch that chin, I think he will find that chin. Again, I'm going to sit this one out. Anytime there's stuff that gets rebooked the very next week, I just, I don't like it. There's weird stuff. I don't know how people are going to approach it. Some people are fine with it. Other people have mental breakdowns and kind of panic and they get weird. This wasn't a big one for me last week anyway, because again, I think Wit is a better fighter, but I think his chin is horrible. And so I don't think it's a, a great, bet regardless um so i I, i'm gonna sit this one out but i think you know again i I think the the one word answer is i think i get i lean quinlan here um you touched on something last week that i i wanted you to repeat if you could uh something about quinlan and training with wrestlers and grappling and all this kind of stuff what were you saying about quinlan yes so so quinlan i asked a, a buddy of mine who is up in vegas d1 wrestler and I asked him, hey, what do you know about Josh Quinlan? And he said, I actually just, uh, I forget if he said he rolled with him or he wrestled with him, but he said he was training with him. And he said he was really, really good on the ground. He had really good cardio and he was very impressed with his grappling. I don't remember if that was jujitsu grappling or wrestling grappling. Um, we know his hands are fast and, and he hits hard and he, he does good stuff. Um, he is a black belt in jujitsu and, you know, he's, he's, yeah. You know, I, I know. Well, the only thing is black belt in jiu-jitsu doesn't mean anything except it means that he's not a fish. And it means that if he does get taken down, that he's not just going to get mounted and, and beat up. Like he's a K1 kickboxer who doesn't have any ground. So yeah, his wrestling is not great. His wrestling's not great, but it, it at least he's going to have good enough grappling to where, I, I, I don't know, maybe he attacks he's got and a stuff shot he gets back up. He, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like he's not a fish out of water. So, I mean – Hearing that, knowing that he's good at jujitsu, knowing that he's fast, knowing that Witt's chin is bad, um, and he had two weight cuts in a row. Again, all the variables, who freaking knows what goes on with, with you know, fighting and not fighting. I mean, I, that's happened to me. I have had I, – my record as a pro was 13-4. and four. And that doesn't include my uh, ultimate fighter fights or my amateur fights, of course, or my kickboxing fights. Just my pro MMA record was 13-4. and four. I – so was that 17 fights. I had way more than 17 fights cancel on me. And I mean, infinitely more than 17 fights in the ups and downs of fights canceling, man, that was one of the reasons why 
any time I thought about quitting the sport was because of that was I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to do this. Fight gets canceled. Fight gets canceled. You can't get a fight. Looking for a fight. Can't get a fight. That stuff messes with people's heads. Um, you know, it's weird. I, I, I don't know if it messes with either of these guys heads, but whether it does or doesn't, I'm leaning Quinlan on this. Um, take that or leave it. Uh, okay. I, I got Quinlan too, a hundred percent because of what you said. Uh, I wanted to ask if your friend's name rhymes with, uh, uh, spider Truman. Hmm. All right. Spider Truman. That's a weird name. I don't, I mean, nothing comes to mind. All right. Well, fair enough. I think he can wrestle a little bit, your friend. So, um, we'll, we'll yeah. take his word yeah, for I it. I think he can. <laughs> um, and our, our friend Spider Truman uh, happened to uh, to lose in a wrestling match, a very important wrestling match against uh, somebody we know whose uh, name rhymes with Trey Botters. <laughs> All right. H2O's? All right, we're, you saying H2O's? Yeah, we're, right. we're morons over here. All right, man. The first fight of the card, we got Yusuf Zalal and Damone Blackshear. Um I'm going to go with this one because this I, I spent a lot of tape on this one. I liked it a lot. We, we I think, barely touched on this. We talked about Blackshear, but we actually didn't even talk about the fight. I watched Blackshear first before I was watching Yusuf. And Yusuf has been out for a year, and he's dropping out in 135. And I, was, I actually thought he might have been cut or injured or something. I, I don't know if what, what the deal was. But I really like Blackshear, man. I, I think he... He doesn't have great striking, I would say, but he lands well. He he lands really well when people press him and they're in short distance. Like he'll, it's not like a good clean straight right or a good clean hook. It's like a little swatting punch that's short, that he kind of shortens because somebody's too close and it's kind of an ad lib strike. Uh, his defensive grappling is phenomenal. I love how he, when people shoot, he attacks submissions, he transitions, he will get put on his back. He will come back up. He does all of the right stuff. He has really good cardio. Um, he, again, his jujitsu transitions are amazing. He, he threw a flying knee. I was watching it with my son, Lennox. He's nine. And he, uh, at one point, uh, Blackshear threw a flying knee, missed it, like almost hits a flying squirrel over the guy's back, like flips over the back, takes the back, finishes the choke. Uh, I, I just, I really, really, really like him. And, and, you know, and then on the other side, we've got Yusuf, who is, um, man, he had, I, I've put him down in the past and, and I've put him down in the past because I feel like he's very good in a lot of areas and he just makes bad decisions. He is on top and jumps to guillotines. He is, you know, he will, I, I forget who it was. It was a few fights ago. It might've been Austin Lingo where, where he would shoot. And all he or Lingo would shoot, and all he had to do was just sprawl and back out. But then he would like jump to the neck and then get in these transitions and end up on the bottom and back up. And if he did less, we always talk about purple belt jujitsu. It's the most exciting stuff to watch because they're just all offense, just going and going and going. If he would just slow it down and do less in so many of his fights, I, I would like him more. Um, but then watching him again, man, he fought Ilya Tupuria. And I mean, Topuria did take that on short notice, but man, he did pretty well in that fight. And Topuria can wrestle, and, and Topuria, you know, and, and Yusuf used jujitsu, used a lot of scrambles, did a lot of the right stuff. Then we see him against Sean Woodson. He got Woodson down a couple times. Um, I I like Yusuf here because I think they're wrestling. Blackshear doesn't use offensive wrestling great. And he has really good jujitsu, he has really good scrambles, but so does Yusuf Zalal. Like his jujitsu is really good. He creates these scrambles. I don't think Blackshear is going to submit him. And I don't think that Yusuf is going to submit Blackshear, but I think they're going to have a lot of these scrambles. I think the wrestling, Blackshear doesn't offensively wrestle a lot or well. He defensively wrestles great. And I think Yusuf's movement is going to be the difference here. His His movement standing... And if you guys saw, you know, if you guys are on the Patreon, I, I posted this last night or the night before because I wanted people to get an early look at it before lines moved. Because 
I think he was minus, he might've even been a plus when I posted that, but I think he's like minus 120 now, something like that. I'll look here in a second, but I like Yusuf's movement and his experience in the UFC to get the job done here. I don't know how much that line's going to move because how could it move? I mean, we, we don't really know. Both these guys are good and both, <clears throat> both have uh, similar fight styles. And there's a lot of kind of factors here, right? We have Yusuf moving down, which has not fared well, you know, the last few years, fighters moving down. And then you got uh, um, Damon Blackshear taking this on short notice. So there's, there's a ton of factors here. Um, I agree with everything you said. I, I think uh, Damon is is awesome. And you know what? I kept mixing him up with, uh, Deandre, uh, Anderson. I'm, I'm a CFFC golden boy. I, I'm watching everything. And I, for some reason, always mix him up. And Deandre is so crazy and just makes so many mistakes, but Blackshear is just clean and technical and precise. And he just does a lot of things right. And I really, 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 really like him. Um, if you look at his record, he's actually beat some good guys. I mean, he beat DeAndre, who is talented, just an idiot. He beat Josh Smith, who's talented, but an idiot. Beat Matteo Vogel. His losses are Danny Sabatello, Pat Sabatini, and the legend Chris Mutino. You know what I mean? So he's he's beating good guys, and he's only losing to good guys. I agree with you. I think I think Zalal is a little bit more agile. I think he Zalal does a really good job of not losing big. My problem with Zalal is he doesn't do a lot to win. Like he was letting Choi back him up the entire time, eating punches and then trying to counter punch and just move. He circles and circles and circles, but there's not a lot of winning on Zalal's part. And that's my big problem with him. So I, I think coming into a week like this, I think you got to sit down and break down this fight, right? You know, um, I think an over is going to be pretty safe. Both guys can grapple their ass off and both guys move really well. I, I the striking, you know, Zalal doesn't really put a lot of pop on his punches. I mean, almost everything on his record is decision, 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 decision. Uh, Blackshear, you know, he's, uh, let's take a look at his. He's submitting a few guys, but I don't think, like you said, he's going to submit um, Zalal. So for me, the play here is going to be an over. I weirdly, I weirdly, weirdly want to take a shot on, on Demond Blackshear. I mean, it's not huge plus money or anything. I just think the the weight cut is interesting because the law is going to be a big 35er. He was not a huge 45er, but he's going to be a big 35er and Damon's already a big 35er. So first time in the new weight class, trying out the test cut versus Damon, who's already been fighting there. Um, I, I'm going to rock Damon with, with zero confidence. I think the over is the best play in this one, uh, but I'm going to go Damon. Okay. Yeah. I I think so. So one, Zalal, you got to remember he's only 25. So it's not like this is a late stage career weight drop. He's young and he's spent the last year away from competition. So he, you know, he's, he's probably one of those guys that's a tweener that, you know, is, could probably make 35. It's going to be hard for him. Whereas 45 is super easy, but it's lean, you know? So I, I could definitely see that. The, the biggest thing is, is, I don't even know if the over is good here, but I, the fight goes the distance. I mean, you know, depending on what the odds are on that, I mean, of course that's a over, but I, I think the fight goes the distance is probably pretty safe too. And if you're going to bet either of them, you may as well bet either of them by decision. Cause I, I mean, Zalal is three and three in the UFC, three wins by decision, three losses by decision. I mean, the odds of, Blackshear or him breaking that cycle are probably pretty slim, especially just given the um, styles and, and technical abilities of both. But I, I think both of them, I think this is going to a decision. The really hard part is where do we put Zalal? Because his three <clears throat> losses are to really good guys, Woodson, Choi, and Taporia. And then his three wins are against not so good guys in Lingo, Barrett, and Griffin. So where where is Zalal truly? Right. And, and he's not even finishing those guys that he probably should be finishing anyways. But on the other side of that, so he's not finishing the guys he should be finishing, but he has these really good moments and looks really good against guys who are very good um, against Topuria. I mean, he had these moments where he should have been just murdered and he made, you know, it's probably one of Topuria's toughest fights in the UFC 
and Zalal he, he took does the a least lot of amount of right. damage. We have talked about yeah. Zalal so much, and we broke him down a million times for the Woodson fight. He does everything so so decent. Like he does, he's just decent everywhere. He's so good everywhere. He does the right things wrestling, but we have always talked about it. He will do ninety nine percent of the stuff right, and then that one percent he just doesn't do. Now maybe in this fight that will be enough. You know, for him, yeah. oh, let's see. I, the free UFC bet guy. I, I maybe I want to switch my pick to Zalal because that was my original instinct. I think he just moves a little bit better, and these are so close, so close. So I'm going to make my pick Zalal just because he's a little bit more agile. But um, I, I just wish he would he would win minutes better. He sticks around. I I think you're right, and what I'm hoping is that he is so young in his like actually young. He made it to the UFC young. He's getting older. Hopefully, he's starting to fight better, just mature as a fighter, to season as a fighter. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, this is a close fight, but I, I like, man, and I really wanted to like Blackshear here right off the bat. I was watching him, and I was like, oh my gosh, he is going to be good win. in the UFC. I love him. I love him. I love him. Yep. And then watching um, Zalal, I was like, gosh, I just Zalal is actually very good. We, I don't give him enough credit because he makes bad decisions. Um, so, all right. Next up, we've got Angela Hill and Lupita Godinez. Uh, your girl, Lupi, who is, what is she, 8-2, and two, and Angela Hill is 13-12. and 12. And this is a weird one in this, just in the sense that, um, gosh, she's 8-2. and two. I'm looking at uh, Angela Hill is 37 and she's on a three-fight losing streak to Verna Jandaroba, who's good. Amanda Lemos, who is my female love of all women's MMA. And Tisha Torres. She beat Ashley Yoder, and then she lost to Michelle Watterson and Claudia Gadelia. But as weird as that is, I feel like she's just getting... I feel like she's gotten better in her last few fights. And she's actually looked really good. She's just losing. We talked about this the last time we, we filmed her and we talked about her. She just, how does she win a fight? She doesn't know how to win a fight. And that's what worries me about her here. What's, what's your thought on her and, and Loopy? Well, <clears throat> this one hits close to home. And uh, I've thought a lot about this fight, a lot about this fight, probably too much about this fight. Um, but the way that I look at this, this is a really interesting, right? Because it got moved a few weeks early. This was actually supposed to take place later. And so you, you look at this from the UFC's angle, right? Uh, you're putting Angela Hill in her, where she lives and trains, and she's become basically part of San Diego. Uh, so this is hometown fight for her against star Lupi Godinez. And stylistically, this seems like a horrible matchup, and I think it is. Now, you know, one thing that's been tripping me up lately is, uh, you know, like uh, MMA Twitter is to me, it's like so annoying sometimes because everyone says she doesn't look or he doesn't look minus whatever. And it's like, hey, dude, you won the fight. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't care. Like, if you win the fight, you win the fight, you win the fight. Oh, it doesn't look minus 900. Like, who cares? I think this is going to be one of those where people say, well, Loopy doesn't look minus 350 or what, whatever. And the reason being is, is Carnalossi, you and I saw that from 10 million miles away. She is not good. And she is especially not good with grappling and somebody who has some semblance of a pulse. Now, in the uh, Janjiroba and Angie Hill fight, I think I was the only one screaming about Angie Hill. I was like, I, I think I love her here. The thing that I underestimated was not that I underestimated it, but I, I, I thought it would cancel out. And it did for the most part, but she still lost every round, was the jiu-jitsu. And the thing that I see with Loopy is, yes, her wrestling is good. She's got an amazing blast double. I don't think her jiu-jitsu is really that good at, at all. I, I mean, I think her control lacks a lot. And let's see. Let's look. I can't remember the girl's name. So when she was fighting like every two weeks, she fought Luana Carolina. She ended up losing that fight. And that was actually the only fight I didn't bet on Loopy in because I said, I, you know, as weird and bad as that girl is, I just see Loopy getting tired after a few takedowns and she's tall and lengthy and knows how to use it and will kind of just stand back up. And Loopy's control is not world class. The other thing that I had a trouble with Loopy uh, with is, is decision making. Yes, she got the arm bar from the back. Okay. Awesome. That's great for a highlight reel. But I think against an ultra veteran like Angie Hill, I don't know that that works exactly the same. 
you know, when she fought, uh, I'm talking about when she fought Silvana Gomez Juarez. Yep. She consistently makes really bad decisions. I mean, the fight with Jessica Penne should not have even been that close. Now, I still think Lupi won the fight. I, I, I wish Lupi would just use her hands. I think she can easily win this Angie Hill fight using her hands. But I think if she tries to wrestle, Angie's so good at bouncing back up and working back to her feet, especially when someone doesn't have the jiu-jitsu upside, they're just a wrestling upside. It's pretty one-dimensional. Um, I, you know, I, I guess my pick here is going to be Loopy. But this one makes me nervous. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not too stupid to realize like who the A side is here. It's obviously Loopy. They love that last performance. She's marketable in two countries, Mexico and Canada. She's younger, you know, faster, probably better skills. But Angie is really tough. She sticks in there. So here's a bet that I like. Um, so on Bet Online, you got your spread bets, right? So we got the point spread, Lupita Godinez, minus 3.5. The odds are minus 190. And Angie Hill plus 3.5 is plus 150. That just means Angie Hill has to win one round on each scorecard uh, for that bet to cash. The queen of split decisions and close fights. Why not give that a shot? Um, I, I like Loopy to win here. Just pressure and dog and tons of just pace and cardio. But I, I like Angie to make this actually a pretty decently close fight. See, I... Don't know, and this again, this is the one fight I didn't tape, so I will tape some stuff before I put my bets out. So take this with a grain of salt, world, because I'm gonna do do some more tape ahead of time. Like you said, she is the queen of split decisions and wins and losses, mostly losses. I could mostly losses, but she is doing that with really good fighters. I mean, Verna, Amanda Lemos. Tisha Torres and half those, I, I thought Torres she won is, those fights. I a hundred percent. I thought she beat Lemos. Um, I thought she beat Claudia Gadela back in the day. Um, and I, I think that Lupi is going to have a hard time with Angie's movement and the rhythm. And it would not surprise me to see Angie get the decision, especially in San Diego with the crowd where, Anytime Angie does anything, the crowd is going to erupt. And anytime Loopy does something, they're pro- they're probably not going to erupt. I could see, I could see Angie getting the getting the split decision win here. Does Angie got it like that in San Diego? The crowd erupts if she throws a punch in San Diego. No, but she's from San Diego, and they're going to come out. And when the announcer Bruce Buffer or whoever it is this time. Um, says in fighting out of San Diego, California, the crowd is immediately going to be behind her. So I think it's Democrats there. I don't know if they erupt. I think they'll be like slow clap. Slow clap. Well, well, of course. I mean, they're, they're going to get their gray poupon and poo-poo a little bit. Uh, so they might just like sneer. <laughs> Rad, dude. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I could see it. I, I like Loopy. I like her. I like her pressure. Um, I think she's going to have a, this is a bull in a matador and, and it wouldn't surprise me to, to see the matador win this one. It's the biggest tragedy to me. Um, you know, we, we called the loopy versus Loma fight. That was a really closely lined fight at the time. And both of us were like, Hey, we love loopy by a mile. I love loopy's hands and her pressure and her aggression. I think, <laughs> I think loopy needs better game planning. I, I let me write Loopy's game plan. I will send it to her. She's got all the physical tools. I mean, she's got insane cardio for how she fights. I mean, her cardio is freakish, never gets tired unless she puts a heavy grappling pace, but her hands are so powerful and so dominant and she can put people on the back foot with those and literally never uses it in the UFC at all. It's crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. You see, you see that a lot. People get, um, People have really good hands and then they get gun shy, especially we were talking about it today. You've got big boxing gloves on, man, everyone's a a world beater. You take those things off, you put MMA gloves on and you don't, you you don't want to necessarily get hit with those things. Um, Sorry, me as I stood there and didn't throw a punch for two, for nine minutes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We've got Odie Osborne uh, taking on Tyson Nam. In the odds, let's see the odds, odds, odds. Bet online has Tyson Nam is plus two ten, and Odie Osborne at minus two forty five. Um, 
And did you know that Odie Osborne was in, uh, he wrestled in high school. I believe he was a three-time finalist, they said. And then he wrestled a year in college, um, which you wouldn't really know it because he doesn't really use his wrestling offensively really at all. I mean, we, we've seen him hurt a little bit and kind of clinch, but but that's pretty much it. But, uh, you know, Odie, we loved him in the Adeshev fight. Uh, I think we made some money there. I don't remember if we, I think we liked him in CJ Vergara. And I don't know if we taped him for Manel. Um, I'm sure we. I think nah, I picked him, but that was pre. We doing this. Yeah. Yep, that was pre this. Um, he's a southpaw, or no? Is he? Yeah. He's to our opposite stance, but I think he's a southpaw, and Tyson is is orthodox. I just forgot which one was whom. But really fast, fast, dynamic, a good wrestler. You know, he good flying knees, just. I mean, he's a very athletic person. Knocked out Jerome Rivera. Um, Huge you know, win. Brian Kelleher. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he moves well. He's very athletic. But he, he leaves a lot of openings. I, I mean, he is not a technical striker. He's an athletic striker who moves well. But the thing with athletic people who move well is in round one, that's phenomenal. But it takes a lot less energy to have a good tight guard and slip two inches because you're just in better position than it does to not have that technical level and have to jolt out of the way by 10 inches. And that takes a lot of energy to do, especially when you're, I mean, with the adrenaline and everything, those big dynamic movements take a lot out of you. He, Nam, on the other hand, is old. Holy shit, he's old. Um 38 years old. He'll be 39 in October. Um, he, he lost to Matt Schnell, but man, the, the, the reason why he lost to Matt Schnell is man, Matt Schnell, anytime they threw, he was throwing three, four, five punches. I mean, he is just a volume son of a gun and would fire in that pocket beautifully. And Odie doesn't do that. Odie will throw one or two punches. These big kind of one, two, big three twos, flying knees. And, and, and I think if he upped his volume, because one of my biggest knocks on Tyson Nam is his volume. He does not have a lot of volume, especially for, for a 35 or his volume is even, you know, very low, but Odie isn't a volume guy either. I mean, he's a big flashy dynamic type of guy, but it's not like he's throwing three, four, five punches again, and again, and again, and again, to where he can steal those, those moments. And Nam, man, that Nam has knockout power. He's losing to guys in the UFC. He lost to Sergio Pettis by decision, Kai Car France by decision, and Matt Schnell by split decision. Uh, beat Adeshev, knocked him out. Beat Jerome Rivera. Um, you know, I mean, so those are not amazing wins. But before that, I mean, he has a decision loss to Zalgas Zumagulov. He beat Ali Bagatanov. I mean, those are good, solid wins back in the day before he got to the UFC. The other thing is these are opposite stance fighters. And, you know, I think with that open stance, he wants that big overhand anyway, and he ducks down. Actually, what he does, I, I mentioned this on the, on the Patreon as well. What I love more than anything is he throws a jab, and then he covers really high with that jab hand as he inches forward off of it. And what he's expecting is to throw his jab to be hit with a counter right hand and then counter with his own right hand. And he does that. He jabs, comes in close in crowds and then swings. And man, he knocks people out with that. I think, I think if you give him 15 minutes to do this, and I think with how much OD kind of faded in that Vergara fight, um, man, I, I think Tyson Yam's pressure, he's got a really tight guard. He doesn't have a lot of, he doesn't do a lot of mistakes, uh, he hasn't shown any chinniness in the past, and he has good power. I really like Tyson Nam here, and at, at a plus two hundred ish, what is he at? Plus, uh, what did I say? He was at plus two ten. Um, I, I think this is one of the better spots on the card. Only thing I don't like about him is his volume. And, and if it was against somebody else, I, I might consider that as as being a really big detriment. But against Odie Osborne, I don't think it's going to be a huge uh, factor. I'm going O'Day here. Uh, I think I'm the one qualified to speak on the flyweights. No, I'm just kidding. Um, 
there's a lot about O'Day to like and a lot not to like. I think that CJ Vergara fight is going to give us pretty decent lines on O'Day for a long time. I mean, he I think he was pretty closely lined or decently lined in the Adeshev fight, which was crazy because Adeshev is a super chinny midget flyweight. I mean, so tiny. But Adeshev at least had pretty good striking, similar to Tyson Nams. A lot of overhands, a lot of darting in and out. Um, and and O'Day ate a few shots. I mean, he eats a couple shots here and there, like from CJ. I, he didn't eat any from Adeshev, but uh, from CJ Vergara caught him a few times because he tries to do the push and pull way too much. I mean, he he's doing that hands down push and pull. My problem is, is that flyweights don't typically have a ton of power. Um, so we really have to hope that Tyson Nam is going to land it, land it on the chin and be able to put him away all in one breath. I, I think the UFC, I mean, I don't think the UFC, Obviously, the UFC is telling you who they want to win here. They want the younger, faster O'Day. He's super exciting, all this good stuff. I like O'Day just from how dynamic he is. I mean, we have seen Tyson Nam shoot zero takedowns, and that was part of the thing that wore out O'Day was a little bit of the grappling, right? Just forward pressure and grappling. But I think he's too dynamic. I think he's younger, faster. He hits from really weird angles. That's the other thing too, is, is Tyson's really good at seeing everything and fighting somebody when they're in front of him. O'Day throws weird punches, punches that I don't see coming because they're not conventional. They're not the same. Um, to me, this spot, I got to go back to basics. I mean, when I see a 38 year old fighter against a young, you know, the younger guy who lives and trains in Vegas, you know, even if it's at syndicate, which I hate, even tonight on the contender series, we see syndicate with consistently the worst cornering advice, the worst game plans. Like it drives me nuts. That would be my only downfall here. Um, but you know, I, I, I talked to, to C rod who used to train with O'Day at, at Duke Rufus place. He said that O'Day is sick. He is really, really, really good. He's really, really talented. Not a lot of holes in his game. Uh, and I don't think that Tyson has the same dog that CJ has. CJ, for as low skill as he has, that guy's got some dog in him. And I, I don't think Tyson has the same. So for me, I'm going to not overthink it. Going back to basics, I'm choosing the younger, faster fighter, the one that's under 35. Uh, I got O'Day here. All right. Interesting. My thing is is normally, of course, I'm a, a big uh, you know, naysayer of people who are over 35. But Tyson Nam, yeah, man, I mean, he, he he hasn't been rocked. He hasn't been chinny. He got knocked out one time in his career by Marlon Marais in 2013. So almost, I mean, nine years ago. Other than that, he, you know, I mean, he, he doesn't make mistakes. Tyson Nam does not make mistakes. He pressures forward. He's going to be in Ode's face for 15 minutes straight. And Ode, he, he better hope he catches him, which nobody else has done. Well, that man is marching him down for 15 minutes. This, and, he's uh, in the same boat as uh, like, Zalal is. Look, look at his record. He's lost to Matchnell, who's solid, Kai Car France, Sergio Pettis, and Zalgas Zumagulov. So he's beating, or I mean, he's losing to guys who are really good that you know he he should lose to. And then he's only beating Adeshev and Jerome Rivera in the UFC. He, I know. So it's like, where is Tyson actually? But actually, he's got really good skills. He's an ultra veteran, but he's 38 years old with only striking upside. No, but let's take a look at that. Let's take a what you just said. Uh, who are the two wins on Ode's record? Well, he has three wins. Uh, Adeshev and <laughs> yeah. Jerome Rivera. Oh, God. And I mean, he did beat CJ Vergara, but he lost to Manel Cape and Brian Kelleher. So, I mean, I would say the the people um, Nam is losing to are are infinitely better than than the people Ode is. And he, he beat Ali Bagotinov, which is sick. And he, uh, he mm -hmm. beat a bunch of Russians. But the other thing too, is that was, you know, five years ago, he was 33 years old. Now he's 38. You know, has, has old man lost? A he step? was a young, yeah, he was a young, young, young man at 33. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that's, that, that's what we got. Who do we have next? Let me see. Let me see what is up next. We've got Gabriel Benitez and Charlie Ontiveros. Um, Benitez is 22 and 10. Ontiveros is 11 and 8. Um, they're, uh, Mowgli, Benitez, is going up in weight, which I like to see, especially later in people's careers, especially as people are missing weight, uh, like Benitez has numerous times. He, he missed against our guy, uh, JP Pierce. He was supposed to fight JP. Missed weight by like five pounds. 
and then was talking shit to JP on Twitter and on Instagram about him being a coward by not accepting the fight. So uh, anyway, um, we've got Benitez. He lost to Onama last, uh, lost to Quarantilla before that, beat Justin Janes, and then he lost to Morales and Sadiq. Um, on the other side, we've got Ontiveros, who is 11 and 8, and has lost, he lost to Steve Garcia and Kevin Holland in the UFC, which was... Yeah, you know, Steve Garcia, we talked about him recently, man. He's he gets hurt and rocked and beat up by everyone on the planet and just somehow finds a way to win and not die and Homer Simpson's it. And uh, you know, anyway, w- what do you got with these two fine gentlemen here? Well, conspiracy me wanted to put my tinfoil hat on and go, "Okay, Charlie Ontiveros, look what he did to these guys. He's super dangerous. He's throwing axe kicks." Man, he's throwing axe kicks. There's a reason we don't see axe kicks in the regular repertoire of UFC champions. I don't see Volkanovski running out to the center of the cage and just dropping axe kicks on people. You know what I mean? Um, I- exactly what we said. I mean, what does that say about Steve Garcia? He got rocked 400 times by uh, Charlie Ontiveros, <laughs> who gets injured in every fight. And, you know, I, I was seeing pe- people say Bruno Silva's a one round fighter. Get the fuck out of here. Charlie Ontiveros is a one round fighter. Charlie Ontiveros says, first round or bust, I'm going to quit. Um, you know, I, I was weirdly a, a, a Benitez hater. Benitez looked phenomenal in the Onama fight. Holy shit. I did not expect that from, I had to rewatch that. You know, this week was my first time watching that fight other than the finish and the entire opening, you know, opening minutes of the round. Fuck his boxing looked insane. His head movement was good. His, you know, he, his, he got taken down and got right back up. I mean, just ultra veteran, but man, did he look good. His body kicks, everything looked phenomenal. So to me, this is the ultimate don't overthink this one. Um, you know, if you're, if you're really on this Ontiveros could catch him train and, and all this stuff, cool. Do Charlie Ontiveros by KO or Charlie Ontiveros round one. But at the end of the day, you got a guy who's training at AKA he's, you know, been in the UFC. He's been fighting a long time. He's got really good skills. The Onama fight was actually, to me, his most impressive fight by far that he's ever had. I thought he looked better than ever. Um, you you want something really safe, but I mean, the, the line's going to be juiced to hell. The fight doesn't go the distance, obviously, but I, I like Benitez by country mile here. As long as he doesn't get sparked in the first, I mean, it's it's all Benitez. That's one-way traffic. Yeah, fight doesn't go the distances. I, I, man, let me see if I can pull. See, see if you can pull that up while I'm yapping over here, because that would be a good line. It's probably juiced as hell, but who knows? But man, yeah, Gabe Benitez. Like, come on, you guys. Ontivero shouldn't be in the UFC at all. He shouldn't be in the UFC. I'm sorry. He's probably a super nice guy. He shouldn't be in the UFC. If like we're done here. I mean, that's pretty much it. Benitez looked amazing. Actually, one thing you said, which is the biggest knock I have on Benitez is that he's training at AKA because Javier Mendez and all the Russians are gone. Um, Kane, who was training him before free Kane. Where's he? Um, in prison. What? Are you not aware of the Kane Velasquez situation? I thought he pulled out of that last fight. Cain Velasquez uh, is in prison for shooting at a car where the, I, gosh, I think it was, uh, I forget all the details. Anyway, the man was in the car who had molested or raped his daughter, I believe, numerous times. And so Cain shot at him and they put Cain in jail. And, and again, you guys, you guys out there, if I'm butchering all these details, please put it in the comments. I'm not trying to be sensational or, or give bad information, but it's something along those lines. So if I'm not a hundred percent, you guys put stuff there. Cause I'm not positive on everything, but Kane is in jail. They will not grant him bail. And the guy who that was either raping or molesting or some sort of sexually assaulting, I believe his daughter or son for a long time is out free in the free world. So Kane is in prison. Yeah. So so Cain trained uh, Benitez for his last fight, was his main guy, did all of the stuff. Cain is not there. I don't know who Benitez is training with. I honestly don't think it matters, but that is my only knock with him and AKA at this point is most of the guys are gone from AKA. And um, I, I, I believe, and, and I don't think they have all of the coaching that they used to have uh, when, when Habib and, and all those guys were over there. 
that said, man, I, I love Benitez here regardless. I really don't care. I don't care if he, you wake him up from the dead. I, I like Benitez here. I think Kane should have been in jail for how many times he shot on uh, JDS. <laughs> it's a crime. It, it, it's funny here because Benitez, it's kind of like the Angie Hill thing. Uh, he has lost four of his last five. His only win in that was against Justin Janes, who's not in the UFC anymore. And he's beating Jason Knight, Humberto Bandene, lost to Enrique Barzola, lost to Andre Feely. He, he He's lost to all of the good guys and beating guys who are just not really cut. And and I think this is going to be one of those Ontiveros is just isn't cut. And I think I think he's he's kicked out after this. I almost wonder if this is a gift to DC for being close with Benitez and letting him get one last. Well, Charlie said run. he's not depressed anymore. Does that does that play a factor? Do you like when a fighter is more depressed or less depressed? Oh, Anytime a fighter starts talking about their mental state, bet the other way. Really? Because, oh yeah. Because the second you start talking about mental states and I'm in a better mental state and I got a sports psychologist and I started working my mental game, that shows me that you were weak before, before you were, you were weak before and now you're talking about it. Hey, look, you can go get a sports psychologist. It comes down to this. Every fighter is scared shitless before a fight. All right, everyone's there. You wake up, you're nervous. You show up, you're nervous. Everybody is scared shitless. Just handle your shit and show up and do business. You don't need to talk about it. You don't need to talk about being afraid. You don't need to talk about the nerves in hopes that other people will calm you down and say, oh, it's okay, it's this, it's that. Don't worry about it. Everyone's nervous. Man, handle your shit. Everybody is scared. You get up. You get any random person and, and they have to go give a presentation in front of 500 people or 100 people or they're going to a, you know, they have a business idea and they're trying to get a loan or they're trying to go to VC funding or anything, anything anybody cares about in life, everyone is scared about. Now just go do it anyway. And, and the second people start talking and start freaking out and they want people to say it's okay, man, immediately I'm going at eh, red flag. Red flag, red flag. So if he's talking about depression or not depression or mental states or not mental states, man, psh, give, give me more money to bet against him. John Jones is my barometer for mental state, mental health. The guy is, the guy is crazy. And man, can he fight his ass off. I like a little bottled up. That's it. Horrible part. Sh Sean Strickland, hey, say what you want. I like me some Sean Strickland and he likes to cram it inside and he goes out and fights let's go yep go in there be as scared as you want everybody is always and handle your business people all right all right next up next up we've got um lucas brzezeski and uh martin boudet and um let me see i'm pulling up my notes here because i want to make sure that i've got all of the right stuff on brzezki um Yes, 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 yes. Um, this guy is who did we have last week? Ehor Pretoria or the week before? Yes, Gr great analogy. Um, you know what's funny? You say okay before you even dive into this because I, I know what you're going to say because you have taught me to think this way. I was in the Discord and I, you know, I'm, I'm reviewing this week and I'm starting my tape and I said, <laughs> Lucas Bresky is Ehor Pretoria of this week, but with less power. Yeah, I Yes. Oddly enough, he's not as bad as Ehor, um, but he does have less power. It, he looks the part, man. Like he's, he's a big, lean, Polish athletic son of a dude. Bitch. Polish son of a bitch. His kicks aren't bad. His leg kicks, his low kicks aren't bad. Um, he will fire off a, a couple punch combos, which aren't as wild as Ehor's, but they're also not as strong. And... Then the dude is just tired. He's tired. He, he, he has, you know, three minutes in, he's tired. Um, his wrestling is not good. His, his striking is not bad, but it's, I mean, it's, it's not phenomenal. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what he's good at. I think he's a big guy who is fighting other big guys and, and the skill level is not great. And if you have a little bit of athleticism and a little bit of training, you're probably going to win most of those fights. And then on the other side, we have Bude, Bude, Budai, whatever the hell his name is. And, and he's huge. He is like, he is a massive human. He has to cut weight to get to 265. His hands are high, good clinch, good control, good cardio. Um, you know, I, I really like everything he does. His, his knees are good. He will sometimes, for you guys out there who are, are not watching the YouTube video, but listening on, on the podcast, you know, think about extending your right hand as if you're going to punch, but pull your head back. That's kind of what Boudet does sometimes where it's like, he, not all the time. Sometimes he's in there and throws, but sometimes in these combos, he'll throw like a one, two and almost pull himself away, which his head kind of pops up, which I don't like. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's going to be exposed here, you know, against Bresky, but just something to note. His wrestling is good. His cardio, everything, man. He is solid. He's just a solid ass big dude who knows how to close distance, put you on the fence, bully you around, and win a freaking fight. Uh, a boo day all day here, all day here, all day here. I, I think this might be that my favorite pick of the week. I don't I don't know what the odds are. Let me look at it really quickly. They're not bad. Um Boudé, where is he at? Did I miss him? Why are his odds they're not on here? Oh, there he is. Um, minus two sixty five. So, I don't know, man. I, I like Boudet here. If you want to go, fight does not go the distance. It's not a bad bet. Um, it, it's risky though because they're heavyweights, and sometimes heavyweights just lean on each other, and weird stuff happens. That's the Boudet special. Um, but boot. Yep, Boudet straight up. Love it. Uh, I am with you 10,000%, and I, I think this is probably one of my favorite spots on the card as well. Watching uh, Lucas Bresky, <clears throat> exactly like Ihor, right? He, I mean, he, he moves well. He looks like he should be awesome. He's from a, a, a place in Europe that you're like, okay, you know, maybe he should fight. But man, this the, the Michael Keita fight was a horrible, 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 horrible look. Now, my, Michael Keita, man, every time that guy fights, how old is he? Michael Kita is now 21, 14, and 1, and he's 42 years old. And they fought, let's see, how long ago? 2019, so three years ago. So he's like 39 years old. And Michael Kita, I don't know if he threw a single punch in the entire fight. Uh, he, I think he won the first round just by leaning on him, just leaning and holding and leaning and holding. Sounds familiar. And then uh, the second round, Bresky got him down. So I, somehow, I, I think Keto was just dead tired. He freaking headbutts him. Boom. Got a point taken off for a headbutt. Um, and then the third round was really close. Like he's just dead freaking tired. And he wasn't even really throwing that many punches. I, I mean, his contender series fight was against Dylan Potter. Okay, no disrespect to Potter, but Potter just got finished in 30 seconds by another 40-year-old heavyweight. He's not great. How Bresky got a contract, I, I cannot believe it. And then I think he popped also for some kind of substance. I don't know what it was uh, after that fight. So how he has a contract, how he's still on the UFC roster, I have no idea. Boudet actually looked really good. He ate every bomb from Lorenzo Hood, which, you know, Lorenzo's not great, but that's a that's a large man to hit you really, really hard. And Boudet stuck in there and, and ate him, ate, ate his best shot. Uh you know what's weirdly? I have this guy. I, I freaking love this guy, and he lost last time. And I put so much money on him. This is embarrassing. But Daniel Dittrich, uh, he fights an octagon. He's got like a losing record, and he's always like a minus four hundred favorite. But Boudet beat him. The guy's actually Dittrich. Honestly, he's got some skills, and he beat him. Took him down. Good cage wrestling. Good striking. Like he moves really well for his size. So um, weirdly, I think this is a. One guy knowing how to fight versus the other guy not knowing how to fight. One guy's got good cardio versus bad cardio. And one guy's got pretty good skills versus decent skills. So I, I think this is a, one of the most shining spots of the week, Boudet. Love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, next up, next up, we've got Yasmin Jeruguay, Uruguay, Haruguay, and Yasmin Lucindo. So we've got a Mexican Yasmin and a Brazilian Yasmin. 
um, I think I went Boudet first. You tell us about the Yasmines, and I'll give you my two cents on this. Cool. Well, uh, Yasmin, I, I think Yasmin's going to win, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, that's my pick. No, Just, I don't think Yasmin will. No. I'm not. I, I completely disagree. I'm going to call her Yazzie J. Yazzie J, I, I kind of like. Um, you know, watching her last fight against Claire Lopez, she got taken down, but she, uh, this was to me like looking in a mirror. E even today, it was so funny. Even sparring today, right? I I'm sparring my first round and I I'm, I'm just like, all I can think about on my mind is like, I want to strike today. I just want to strike. That's all I want to do is strike. And so I'm chasing somebody down to go, uh, to go strike and throw some bombs. And then I get taken down and I'm like looking like, what the, f I thought we had an agreement here. And, uh, that, that fight was really similar to, to what she did, right? She was wanting to kill Claire Lopez, just come in, fire these fast one twos that she has, and then got taken down. I was like, what the fuck? I thought we had an agreement. Um, she stood up pretty decent. She's got really fast hands and she's mean. I mean, I, I love her speed. Her chin's a little bit high. There's some technical things. She's a little bit sloppy and all over the place. But um, when she throws, that hand speed is is clean. It's nice. I mean, she's she's good. Um, I, I think what this comes down to, so the other girl is pretty annoying. I mean, she shoots in. She opens her hands wide and shoots in with her face first to grab a body lock clinch and then hopes that she can drag something to the ground. The, the one thing that I liked from uh, Yazzie J in, in that Claire fight was first thing she did when she hit the ground was she's popping back up. So at least she has some kind of awareness. Um, half the girls that the, uh, that the Brazilian has fought would just kind of fall over with the wind or were completely outmatched, complete tomato cans. I, I think this is the USC telling you obviously who they want to win. The Entram girl who's undefeated, who's fast and dynamic, got good striking. Uh, I, I, I like Yazzie J here. I, and I think this could get close and it could get extended, but I think those hands are going to be the difference. Even if, um, what's the other girl's last name? Lucindo. Even if Lucindo gets her to the ground, uh, I, I, you know, and wins three minutes and 50 seconds of the round, I think, uh, Jaguari, Yazzie J getting up and, and putting on a fist of fury for 10 seconds might win her, win her the round. So it could get hairy, but I like Yazzie J here. It, it, it's interesting what you said. It's she just goes in, gets a body lock takedown, but she somehow drags these girls to the ground. It, it's so insane to me. But this, I don't get this fight at all. I am so freaking confused because the Lucindo was signed. I mean, this is her first fight in the UFC. It's not like she's a contender girl. She's twenty years old. Why did they sign this girl? Like, I mean, did they literally just need her to, yes, they found to get beat or up. tried to find a girl that was, and so that makes you wonder if they're trying to find somebody so bad that they have to sign that they don't even have somebody on contract because they need somebody so bad to lose to this girl that they're trying to push. That's a red flag in its, in its own right. And who is it that they brought in against B Malecki? Who was like that five two tank that just beat B, B up? Um, and sent her into a concussion minute. for the rest of her life. She doesn't have long COVID. She got long concussion, and that's like not to joke about, but kind. Yeah, she put that in her bio. On no, Instagram. yeah, I mean it, <laughs> concussion. It's kind of strange. So, I, I mean, man, Yasmin, Mexican Yasmin. I mean, you said it. She has fast hands. She has good boxing. Um, she she got taken down very easily, but she did pop up. And, and but then that other girl she fought there just gassed and freaked out. She looked panicked and she just took a beating afterwards. Both of these girls, both the Yasmins, are very bad. These girls are not going to go far in the UFC, I, I, at least where they're at right now. Yeah, Mexican Yasmin is a hundred percent the A side here. She's fit. She looks the part. She's fast. She's Mexican. I I, I am not screaming this from the rooftops. But from a window, I, th I think this is going to be a very close. Yeah. Like a window. I think this is going to be a very close fight. And I think it is absolutely a coin toss. I would not be surprised to see Brazilian Yasmin get the upset. And my thought on that is she's actually not, I mean, her hands are ugh, like her, her hands are wide. She's clunky. Like you said, her face is kind of right there, but when she does actually swing, she throws big, powerful shots. Like they're just heaters enough to where. I, I, this kind of reminds me of the Brogan Walker fight 
uh, oh, yeah. last Good week. Comparison. And it, honestly, that, that to me is this fight right here. Brogan Walker, I think, was better everywhere. She looked more physical. She looked like better stand-up. She, I mean, on tape. In, in the fight, actually, I thought the other girl, I forget her name. I thought she even won the stand-up on everything. But on tape, um, I thought Brogan Walker looked the part. We knew that the, the other girl had better jujitsu, but that's kind of, okay, does she get it to the ground? Whatever. Um, Brazilian Yasmin actually has decent jujitsu. She has good top pressure. And I actually think her, she has heavy hips. She looks she looks good on top. I wouldn't be surprised to see just Brazilian Yasmin throw a couple big bombs, grab a body lock takedown, and able to drag it to the de- to the ground enough and get on top and win and, and spoil the the Mexican Yasmin's UFC party. I, I'm not like I, I'm I'm not going to bet money on this because I don't like either of these. I think both of these girls have a, just so much to be desired. Um, it, it's a coin flip to me. I, I think Mexican Yasmin is the better fighter. I think that's who the UFC is pushing here. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised to get an upset. I'm not even going to go with a pick on this. This is one of those rare times. Really? Like, I, I know. Me- yeah. I mean, I think Mexican Yasmin should win. I wouldn't be surprised if Brazilian Yasmin does win, but I think both of these two are just really bad. Their level of competition is really bad. They both have really big holes in their game. It's the first time either of them are fighting in the UFC in a live crowd. I don't like the bet. I don't like either of them as fighters. Um, I do like Yasmin's hands. I think those are good. Uh, Mexican Yasmin. And and I do think that she's the one who has the opportunity to go further. Um, eh, I guess guess I'll I'll, I'll barely lean Mexican Yasmin. I guess, but man, I would not be surprised to see Brazilian Yasmin. I think get the I think Yazzie J covers her price. That's the phrase. Look, I'm, I'm learning. I think she looks minus ten million. Uh, no, I think she covers her price. I think she's going to win this fairly, fairly easily. But hey, Arizona's not a far away from Mexico. Maybe she needs to come up and learn some good old fashioned wrestling with TC with Tracy Cortez. Right. So. I I like it. I like it. Um, also, I also, don't like that fight. Neck tattoo. I mean, how do you factor that in? Man, that means, man, you do not care, but also that you might not be willing to put in the time. Well, my old coach used to tell me that if somebody is spending a lot of time getting tattoos, that means they're not training. Now, imagine a, a neck tattoo. I mean, come on, that hurts. I'm gonna need some time off. Man, that means you're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. And you clearly care about your health. All right. Next up, we have, we have Nina now Nunez, um, and Cynthia Calvillo and Nunez is 10 and seven. She lost to Mackenzie Dern. No harm in that. She got armbarred by Mackenzie and she lost to Tatiana Suarez. Before that, she beat Claudia Gadella, uh, Randa Marcos, Angie Hill, Jocelyn Jones, Lieberger. Um, and then on the other side of that, we've got Cynthia Calvillo, nine and four, lost three in a row. All the good talent. Um, Chukagian, Jessica Andraj, uh, Angela Lee. Um, and I think, let me see the odds on this one, because Cynthia was a favorite. Um, minus 172 Calvillo, and Nina Nunez is plus 147. And uh, I think the... The two things about this fight that I, I, I think are telling are the age of Calvillo and not women age differently in, in terms of like what they can take and damage and this and that. But, but with Calvillo, her age, it doesn't look like she has that drive, that like fight to just go win, which you need. You need to be a dog in MMA. And, and then the other part of that is Nunez's wrestling and man Nunez gets taken down almost every first round but against really good people and she defended man against Tatiana Suarez she did a good job defending 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 she got taken down she'd get back up she'd get taken down she'd get back up and Tatiana Suarez I think is a very good wrestler she's a very good grappler in in the women's division um and Nunez comes on strong. She just gets better and better and better. You know, she's almost guaranteed to lose round one, but she's taking girls' cardio 
for doing it. And she gets hit, I think, more than she should for being a grappler because I think she's so worried about the takedown that like, it's almost like, oh, I'm, I'm waiting for the shot, waiting for the shot, and then she gets punched in the face for waiting for the shot. It's like the opposite of um, Yaz- Mexican Yasmin. She's one and knock somebody out so much that she gets taken down. You know, you're just not paying attention. You're kind of thinking about the wrong things. But once she finds a rhythm and once she gets that jab going, she she really does see stuff well. She pulls well. She's got good eyes. She's got good fundamentals. She's got good striking. She has good volume. Um, and again, I think she does the right stuff on the ground when she she's defending the wrestling well. And when she does get taken down, she's kicking off and scrambling and going. On the other side of that, we have Calvillo, who I think is going to be physically bigger, more durable in the grappling sense, not necessarily striking sense, but I I don't know that she's going to be able to consistently get Nunez to the ground. And I think she might get her to the ground early. And I think Nunez will pop back up. And I think that's going to really frustrate Calvillo. And, And I think actually Calvillo might land some shots striking. I think Calvillo's best shot is going to actually be striking. And, I think that's where she's going to do her best work, but I think she's going to try and wrestle too much, which is actually going to be where Nunez shines by defending the shots and defending the wrestling. But I think Nunez is going to get hit more because she's so worried about the striking early. And I think as, as the rounds go later, I think Nunez is volume. And I think her technical striking will start to find a rhythm. And I'm not wowed by Cynthia's striking. She kind of crosses her hands as she punches. She drops her hands. She loops. But she's going to throw big, hard, solid punches and close the distance. I I like uh, Nunez here, I think, a lot. I think a lot, a lot. Because I think I love her cardio. I love her volume. I, I love her fight IQ. And I think her wrestling is just getting better and better and better. And I think Calvillo is on the the decline. I just... I don't think she's going to be able to consistently get it. But I don't think to beat Nunez, you just got to have hate in your heart. And I think Calvillo's hate level is diminished enough to where the volume of Nunez is going to get the job done. This is, uh, if I can pull out the same card that you just tried to pull out, this is one that I really don't want to pick a winner. I like Cynthia Calvillo. I like a lot of stuff that she does. And I actually 100% agree with you. I don't even think grappling is her path here. I know she's got a lot of like rear naked chokes or she takes people down, finds her back and chokes them out. I think the standup is 100% her way to win here. Just volume, pressure on the inside, using that clean boxing, using the feints. She does that stuff well, where Nunez is really wide stance, a lot of kicks, a lot of Taekwondo weirdy stuff. Uh, that last fight was just really concerning. Just completely saying, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. That being said, uh, Nunez has what? Five minutes, four minutes and 48 seconds of fight time in the last three, three and a half years. Like something crazy. She's no spring chicken either. She's 36. She's, you know, taking care of a baby. She's getting ready for Amanda's camps. She's kind of doing her own thing now. And you know, at that, that new gym, it's not centered around her and her fight camp. That's centered around Amanda. Um, my heart tells me Calvillo, and I think I'm going to make that my pick with zero conviction. I have, I have literally nothing to back it up. Uh, I'm praying that she's just ran into the brick wall. That was Andrea Lee, who has great front kicks, lots of pressure and just kept throwing stuff like just all the time, just filling, filling, filling that space. I'm hoping Calvillo at least looks good for one more fight. She gets a W, then she can retire, go do whatever else she wants to do. I, I hate to pick this fight. I mean, I really just hate to pick this fight. We There's so many unknowns. They're both old ladies. They're both had good moments, bad moments. I go Calvillo, but not by a long shot and with zero conviction. Yeah, you know, it's funny you brought up the Andrea Lee thing. And I'm not holding that loss against Calvillo because Andrea Lee is really good. And she was getting her ass whooped. And even the stop, mm -hmm. and even the stoppage, I'm not holding that against her. You know, honestly, I mean, and and she lost to Andrade before that. Andrade is a horse. Like, I am not holding either of those things against her. Forever. All phenomenal. I think it's a stylistic matchup of I don't think she's going to be able to consistently get Nunez to the ground. I think she's going to try. And then I think 
the thing with women's MMA, if you if you're not very dominant in a, in an area like like you have Tatiana Suarez, who's just grabbing you and dragging you down, or like Andrea KGB, you know, in her last fight, just long reach, stick and punches, mean. Then I think a lot of it comes down to volume, and, and I think Nunez's volume is going to be the difference here. All things considered equal, I think volume is what is going to win it, and, and that's that's why I'm leaning Nunez here. Not Calvio, but not 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 the past performances, just just stylistically. Right, fair enough. Okay. Um. Next up, next up, next up. Oh, Devin Clark, uh, Azamat Mirzakhanov. What you got? This one is super interesting to me. We both liked Azamat a lot when he was going to fight Jared Van uh, Vandera. Who I didn't. By the way, you 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 kept putting that poison out there that I picked Vandero over Spivak. That was like two years before we even started this podcast. Fucking ding dong, come on. Picked him. I remember oh, it. God. Um, I, I, and then I think the last fight we both picked Tafan over Azmat, and I think the read was perfect. I think it was on his big fucking block head was perfect until it wasn't, which was so sad because. You know, watching the fight, they were talking about how the live odds were going, and you could see him huffing and puffing and out of breath. Now, I know where you're going to go with this. To me, Devin Clark is uh, is Michael Johnson of of light heavyweight or heavy. What weight is this fight at? Light heavyweight. heavyweight yeah, Devin right? Clark is it yeah, light heavyweight? Devin yeah. Clark is uh, Michael Johnson of, of light heavyweight. Man, he's got all the skills. Everything in the world. He's so dynamic. He's fast. He can wrestle his ass off. Big, powerful strikes. And he just consistently finds ways to lose. It drives me insane. I I, I can't remember. I, did he switch camps before the last fight with uh, William Knight? He switched camps a lot. Like, he is kind of all over the place. What? He was in South Dakota where he's from. And then he was at... Uh, somewhere else then he was at jackson wink then now i think he's up at team elevation i i like him here i really like him here i i think that azimat is agile and he moves really 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 well um you know he's got that crazy in and out style and those overhand punches but look at look at how easy tafan had it he kept a high guard and he walked forward and didn't die and Azamat round two is exhausted. Now, I, I think one of the things that we said is that Azamat has really good counter wrestling, but do we really know that? I mean, watching him with Tafan, he his hips didn't look insane and phenomenal, and you know he he's getting people off him right away and circling off the cage. I mean, every exchange is just wearing on him and wearing on him and wearing on him. Just moving forward, just enough. Tafan taking his time. I think, and I'm hoping. Because this is just pain. Every time we go Devin Clark, it's just pain. Every time you, you bet Devin Clark, it's just you're going to feel it one way or the other. But Devin Clark, man, he wrestles so well and he moves so well. I'm taking a shot on Devin Clark here. I think he's going to drag Azamat down. If not the first attempt, it'll be two, three, four. And that tough gas tank that requires so much you know, bounce in the step and, and, and pop and in and out movement. I think Devin Clark is going to wear on him. Whatever change he made in the last fight, he looked great. Good game plan, good wrestling, powerful strikes as as usual. I, I like Devin a lot here, and I, I read your Patreon notes. You know, he's got 15 minutes to fight. You know, to make a mistake, and that is a thousand percent right because we see that with Michael Johnson. We see that with so many guys. But uh, to me, he's too talented first of all, have the record that he does, but he's too talented for me not to take a shot on him against a guy with bad cardio and dependent on that big bomb. Devin Clark reminds me of Mike Van Arsdale. If you guys remember Van Arsdale from back in the day, he was an Iowa national champion, just athletic as could be. A man, just wild and would just make these really bad decisions. And man, I, Devin Clark is so talented. Like he said, he's a state champ. He's a JUCO national champ. Um, he gets rocked and almost killed in every single fight. And he doesn't wrestle until he gets rocked. 
It's not, I mean, against Alonzo Minifield, he just ran across the cage, grabbed him. Um, and so there was absolutely that. And then Menifield rocked him and hurt him and kind of jumped, you know, on him when he, when he should have been a little bit more tempered and, and should have been able to probably finish him. Um, man, I, I just, you know, I said on the, on the Patreon, the Mirzakhanov reminds me of Igor Valchanchin. If you guys out there, old Igor, he just high, used to hand, used to like, wave up and down, up and down, up and down. He's five, eight, five, nine fighting at heavyweight. And he had this like kind of bouncing karate style and, and would just lay people out with that, that overhand. Mirzakhanov reminds me of that. And, and gosh, I'm not huge on Mirzakhanov. And I, I, I wasn't big on him about the Tefan fight. And, you know, I, I thought we were hundred percent right on that read and shit happens. It's MMA flying, need him, got knocked out. That said, man, I, I just, you got to go with the guy that consistently does the right stuff. And although he does get tired. All right. So here's the thing. If you take, you're taking Devin Clark and Mirzakhanov and you say they fight a hundred times. Mirzakhanov is going to win more fights than Devin Clark. If, if you play that out because he does the right stuff more often, Devin Clark does the wrong stuff. That doesn't mean Devin Clark's not going to win some of those fights. He could win one. He could win 49 of them. But he consistently is wild as shit, and Mirzakhanov is consistently precise. predictable and precise. And, and because of that, I've got to go Mirzakhanov here because I know what I'm getting. Um, I mean, hey, if you want a good dog play, Devin Clark is a phenomenal dog play. He could absolutely win this by his wrestling. You said it. He, he will use his cardio. He's almost like J.P. Pierce. J.P., is like, man, I'm going to go get tired out there. Gregor Gillespie, he's like, let's go get tired out because he knows if he's tired, somebody else is tired. And, and Devin Clark, man, is, is a wild kind of fighter who's okay getting tired. I think Mirzakhanov is going to learn from the Nchukwi fight. And, and honestly, with the Nchukwi fight, was Mirzakhanov's wrestling that bad? Or is Nchukwi just a short, stocky brick house of a human who – was just hard to take down. You, I mean, we see those guys where some yeah, guys he just doesn't have offensively hips and you're like, wrestle. Eh, never mind. What well, what I was saying is when Tafan was in on the legs a few times, and you're seeing kind of like, yeah, but if Tafan was a little bit better wrestler, maybe a JUCO national champ or something, maybe he could get him down. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But Mirzakhanov shot on uh, in Chukwe once, or I believe it was once, and he shot in transition, transition, and then let it go. But his transitions actually look clean and like, oh, this looks the part. And then he was like, nah, I'm, I'm good here. I'm not going to mess around. And first of all, and Chuck, head is the size of, I mean, it has its own gravitational pull. That thing is huge. Um, man, I, I like Mirzakhanov. I, I think he just is, is the smarter fighter, the more precise fighter. I think his in and out movement is really going to make uh, Devin Clark guess some stuff. And, and uh, I think he's, I think he's a better fighter. I think he's a better fighter. I have to go with a better fighter here. All right. We disagree on this one. <sighs> All right. What's up next? Uh, Mirshart, Bruno Silva. Um, there's not much to say here about this guys. Um, can, can I take Mirshart's plus two forty? Bru yeah. Bruno Silva's minus two eighty. Give it, give us your thoughts on, on this. And, and I will too. I will too. Bruno Silva. Okay. I, 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 I couldn't believe what I was reading. Someone's, he's first round dependent. Bruno Silva fought Alex Pereira hard as shit for three rounds with one of the best kickboxers in the world. Tooth and freaking nail. The guy is excellent. You know, everyone wants to come down on Wellington Terman. I think Wellington Terman has excellent cage wrestling, right? Wellington took him down. Bruno, Bruno chilled reversed him and put the man to sleep from ground and pound. It was insane. The power that he has, he was ultra veteran against, uh, Andrew Sanchez, right? Andrew Sanchez can wrestle his ass off. He's very, very, very good. And Bruno, you know, if, if Bruno was first round dependent, then don't you think getting worn like a blanket uh, for two rounds would, would have made him pretty tired and he wouldn't be able to finish, but no, he said, all right, I got this, put it on Andrew Sanchez and put him out. It's not really his fault that he's putting everybody to sleep in the first round. He's got insane God-given power. 
but he's very calm, very calculated. And the guy knows how to freaking fight. He can box, he can wrestle. The guy does a million things. Well, Mearshart to me is almost essentially Paul Craig, right? I mean, he's, he's almost Paul Craig. Like he will just lose 99% of the exchanges and the fights until he finally finds a way to win. Just, I, I would say it like this. It's minus 270, minus 280, whatever. Uh, Bruno Silva has all knockouts in the UFC. He beat Alexander Slomenko, Artem Frolov, uh, Kovalev, all these guys in M1 by knockout, and then went tooth and nail with Alex Pereira. Mearshart was losing to Dustin Stoltzfus before he finally pulled it out. I, I, I mean... I think that's, you know, if by some miracle he wins, then, you know, I deserve to lose all my money, but I feel very confident in, in, in Bruno Silva here. Yeah. The only thing I'm going to re- really going to say on this is Mearshart is dependent on people gassing out and screwing up. Like that is his whole thing is, is stay here long enough for them to be tired and mess up and I will be there to capitalize. And that is not a plan that you can bet on. You cannot bet on hoping that people screw up and mess up because if they don't get tired and they don't screw up, you don't have a way to win. And and man, Mearshart has, he has lost a lot of people, a lot of money (laughs) because he won't die. Like, and he pulls these miraculous things out of his ass, man. And you absolutely have to give him credit for a lot of that stuff, man. You absolutely do. He finds a way to win and he's tough. And, but Mearshart doesn't have this amazing cardio either. No, He gasses pretty hard, but just has a will to win and, and will just keep fighting. So you absolutely have to give him credit for that. He's tough as nails. He wins fights. He shouldn't, he's win. he win wins fights. He's losing, uh, you know, but. Again, you've got to bet on the better guy. Bruno Silva is the better guy. And I mean, that's that's the play here. That's the play here. And, and man, it's gambling. It's gambling. Last year, I forget who it was. Um, who beat Green Bay last year? Uh, the Packers. I think it was like Detroit. Was something Are you bringing like, up this reference that was back their to only back win? And they end- Are you going to bring this up back to back weeks? Yeah, yeah. But that's it. I might bring it up every week. So shit Shout can out to happen, the Detroit man. Lions. And Mearshart, yeah, Detroit Lions always till we die. Um, <laughs> man, you're not going to bet on them. You, you don't bet that plus 1,000 football team hoping that they get the biggest upset ever. You might, but you'll do it the next week and the next week and the next week, and you'll end up minus 10,000 in your can bank Can I admit account. something? I... I, oh, I hate the to me the NFL is like so rigged like all the major sports are rigged even UFC and, and, and MMA to a certain point feels pretty rigged one way or another I bet the Lions every single week with like real money like a comma sometimes but like on a spread never like a money line I'm not that I'm not an idiot but I would go into the week and see like a 40 point spread and I'm like they're going to beat them by 40 points. Yeah, right. And I would just bet it every single. And honestly, I think the Lions covered the spread. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. I think they covered the spread like the majority of the season. So I was like funny. It's like always a parlay piece. <laughs> oh, man. I love it. I love it. So you're the guy that they're making money off of. Hell no. Uh, call me an event time. We've got David Onama and uh, Nate Landweller. Um this fight watching tape before watching tape, I thought Nate is going to give Onama some trouble because Nate is, we've talked about him before and we call him an ape and that is not a false statement. That is a hundred percent a true statement. This, if there is an ape, it is Nate Landweller. Um, or Nate Landweir. Oh, fuck man. You guys know I can't speak. Um, Dude is just screaming mid fight, running at people, hands down, punching himself in the face in a fight. Like, I, like, how does that count? So, if Nate is fighting and you're doing punches landed, do the punches that he hits himself with count as punches landed on him on the, uh, like, you, you know, on the stats? Like, I, I don't know how that works, but uh, I mean, he's actually not bad, man. He's fifteen and four. He lost flying knee to Erosin. He lost uh, knee 
to Herbert Burns, beat Darren Elkins, who's tough as nails, and he beat Ludovic Klein, who just beat Mason Jones. Uh, and and why, it, I remembered that fight as a horrible fight that Ludovic Klein just went up there swinging and going and going and going and just gassed himself out. But that wasn't the case at all. Like he, he was honestly kind of settling back and Nate picked him apart, beat him up, choked him out. And, um, you know, he's tough, man. He's gone to M1 and, and beaten the 16 and 4, 18 and 7, 10 and 1, 14 and 3, 13 and 2. Uh, he's beating really good guys, man. Um, it, it just out of toughness and grit and cardio. I mean, he has cardio for freaking days. He's pretty athletic. On the other side of that, we have Onama, who I wanted to think was like this dynamic, athletic guy who is going to get tired and. I, I don't know. And I thought maybe Nate would, would wear him out. I, I don't think so, man. I think Onama's cardio is good. I, I think his basics are good. I think he's fast. I think he's long. I think he hits hard. I think he's tough as shit. Um, I, I, I mean, maybe, 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 maybe could see Nate pulling something off at the, at the end of a third round if Onama is just, you know, almost finished Nate early in the first or the second round and kind of blew his load or something like that. But I like Onama here. I, I think he's dynamic. I think he's going to find uh, Nate's chin a lot. And even if he doesn't put him away, I think he's going to win a decision here. I, li I like Onama. Um, I, I think Nate is better than I've given him credit for in the past, but I think Onama gets it. I think he gets it here and I think it's pretty decisive. I, I'm with you a thousand percent. And we, you know, we actually, this is the only one we talked about at the gym. I said the exact same thing in, in my mind, the Ludovic Klein fight is Nate was in his face and saying, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to make this dirty and just wear on you. And it really wasn't that. And if we had ape Nate, I would actually like this much better, right? Nate sticking in Onama's face, going crazy, swinging bombs. I could see him actually winning this fight, like like catching Onama, actually making Onama tired just from having a dog fight. But the Nate that we're seeing now is the complete opposite of uh, of that Nate the train, right? He he does sit back, he counter punches. He's just not as fast as Onama. I I really, 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 my dogs this week that I really wanted to play was, was Nate, the train. And I wanted to play Devin Clark. And, you know, after watching film, I, I think the only one I can play is Devin Clark. I just think that Onama's faster. He grapples well. He can use his athleticism to get out of positions that he really shouldn't be in. Uh, you know, people want to give him slack for the, uh, the arm field fight. Arm field was solid, man. He's, he's going to be a really good 35er. I know he's going to get beat his next fight, but, um, you know, other than that, he'll have a pretty decent UFC career. Uh, I, I like Onama. I don't want to go too much on it because literally everything that I would say is exactly what you already just said. All right. All right. We, we like Onama. Um, man, main event time, Marlon Vera, Dominic Cruz. Um, man, it's crazy to think Dominic has been around the sport forever. And he's still here and he has had years where he hasn't fought because of injuries. I mean, man, if you guys even knew all the, all the craziness that that guy has gone through injuries and in, in recovering and coming back from stuff and being injured off of injuries and still coming back and fighting his record is 24 and three. Um, he lost to Cejudo. He lost to Cody Garbrandt, and then years and years and years ago, in 2007, he lost to Uriah Faber. Um, gosh, he's just been doing it forever. Who do you got here? I, I could feel like an idiot for making this pick, but here's the way that I look at this. Cheeto is, an, is a really good fighter. Because I know if we're critical at all, people are going to come for us and say, you guys are idiots. You don't know what you're talking about. Cheeto is very, very good. And he's a game fighter. You know, he's always willing to stand in the pocket. The Davy Grant fight was amazing. Like he's had so many great, amazing, amazing, amazing fights. And I picked Frankie Edgar over Marlon Vera. And two rounds in, man, I was feeling like a genius. I'm like, man, this was such an easy read. Cheeto lays on his back for whole rounds. Like he just doesn't get it. Um, I'm going to try one more time. And the reason I'm going to try one more time. Yes. Frankie Edgar was a champion, but he'd been chinned so many times at that point that, you know, we, we knew that was a liability. Dom got chinned last fight by Pedro Munoz. 
who I think probably hits like a freaking truck. I mean, there was a reason that O'Malley was not ready to just engage and step up in the pocket, right? Because he knows he's got power and that's his path to victory is, is big bombs and calf kicks, right? I, I, I think I look at the matchup like this. Dom can wrestle his ass off. He comes from crazy angles, all kinds of different things. And where he gets beat is guys that will meet him in the middle and meet him in the middle with power. Just like the Garbrandt fight when we watched that, that's the whole reason for, you know, kind of some of the styles that, uh, that you've brought to us and that I do now, the car crash style. It was because of that fight, I think. I mean, when, boom, he met him in the middle, stopped him. That's a great style. Cheeto, to me, doesn't throw with enough power to chin Cruz. I think the way that we see this is we have one of the smartest, most intellectual fighters that the game has ever seen. I mean, the guy studies as much or more tape than we do. And I I really believe him when he says it because he really knows what he's talking about. So I think we have the highest fight, you know, uh, the highest IQ fighter that we can have on the roster who's got wrestling upside times a million, you know, Cheeto's not hard to take down. I, you know, I think he's got cardio for days and you're hoping that Cheeto who doesn't have like one punch power and not a lot of one punch knockouts, you're hoping that Cheeto is going to KO him or, you know, Dom's old and he's going to show his age. I think Dom is taking care of his body forever. So for me, I'm going Dominic Cruz. Uh, I think he, I think he's just the better fighter. And, you know, from our sponsor bet online, if you want to look, there's a spread line here too. The dominant cruise plus 3.5 rounds. So if you think he can peel off two rounds and then it goes to decision and he loses, you're still going to win that bet. So for me, the, the pick is dominant cruise. Yeah. You know, I have to qualify this with, you know, we know I've known Dom since he was 18, 19 years old, you know, love Dom, know a lot of people who know him. So there's that. Um, yeah, I mean, Chito is is a volume guy and a pressure guy and somebody that comes on late as people fade. Dominic Cruz is known yeah. to be a cardio machine. Like, he doesn't do that. Dominic says it, and you actually brought something up. You said, I think Dominic watches more tape than us. I think he absolutely does. And not only does he watch tape, he actually, for his commentary, will watch tape. He has cue cards, and then he will actually study and make people – um study with him and he'll bounce stuff off. And what about this? And what about that? And make sure that he's right. So he actually does it. He does practice runs and test runs ahead of time to make sure that he's got everything down. Uh, Super smart guy, super analytical. And one thing is, and he said this a lot in in fights is he loves Muay Thai guys. He loves when people traditional Muay Thai, because they're right there in front of you. Mm hmm. And he is not there in front. He is in and out and bouncing left and right. And where is he? And for that alone, I think this is a tailor-made fight for Dom. I, I think cardio is going to be negligible. I don't Both think it's going to play. I think Dom can, yeah, I think Dom can dictate the wrestling. And even if he doesn't dictate the wrestling, the fear of the wrestling is always going to be there that he's got to address. So Chito's tough. When he does get taken down, he throws elbows, wiggles his hips. He's a squirrely little bugger. Um, He's big, he's tall, he's got really good kicks, good elbows, good Muay Thai. Chito is very good. I just think stylistically, Dominic is not going to stand in the pocket and trade with Chito. And, you know, I I think this is a five-round decision for Dom in a relatively competitive fight. But I think this is is a a Dom fight, and I think it's tailor-made for him. Wow. So we're both in agreement. I think we're going against the grain here. I think everybody's so obsessed with Cheeto and, you know, for good reason, like he is, he's pressure, he's in your face, but you think Dom doesn't know that he doesn't prepare for that. He doesn't know how to fight. I mean, Dom is such a legend of the sport. He's been around for a million years, but it's, you know, he's not getting chinned every fight. He's beating guys at the highest level. His style is really hard to replicate and it's really hard to figure out, especially as a main event in his hometown on a moment's notice to try to figure it out when he's standing in front of you, trying to hurt you also. So I'm going to take it. I like Dom. Yep. The the other thing is we saw Aldo. How did Aldo beat Cheeto? Is he wrestled him? And I think Dom is going to be able to do that. And I think Dom is probably a better offensive wrestler than Aldo defensive wrestling, man. Aldo's 
probably one of the best we've ever seen. But offensively wrestling, I, I think Dominic is going to be able to do, replicate what um, Aldo did. And, and the other thing is I, I think that people are overvaluing the Rob Font win. And what I mean by that is Say it. Font looked so amazing in that fight in so many moments, but I think Font's chin is not what it once was. And, and I think Font looked really good and would just get clipped and he would get clipped and he would get clipped. But he did that against Aldo as well. He would win like three and a half minutes of a round and then just get rocked so badly where he's almost finished. And, and I think that's what happened on, on this fight. I love Rob Font. I, I think Font is freaking amazing, but I think his chin isn't what it was. And I think he, he came out so hot. I think they said he threw a hundred punches in that first round and then replicated the second round. I don't, th I think he faded. I think his cardio faded. I think he went out too hot. And, and because of that, he, that coupled with his chin, I think he paid the price for it. Um, Dom isn't going to do that. I think he's going to touch and move and matador bull, um, bull his way to, to a victory here. Rob Font gave Cheeto the fight that Cheeto wants. Davy Grant gave Cheeto the fight that Cheeto wants. All these guys are giving Cheeto the fight that Cheeto wants. And then the one that he threw a hissy fit was Aldo, who is an amazing striker and said, wait a minute, let me take the easy, easiest path to victory here. And let me wrestle and take your back. And I'm going to win this fight. And he's throwing his hands up and going crazy. I think Cheeto is awesome. I think he's gangster. I think, he, you know, that guy loves to fight. And I think he's a very good actual fighter. I think sometimes his ego takes over his game planning and He's just willing to be there, and he's had the the fortune of of guys who are giving him the fight that he wants. And do you think the best fight IQ guy in the business is going to do that? I don't think so. So I I feel I, I love Dom in the spot. I think. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And with that, I'm out. I'm out. That is that is it. We have another show in the books. I'm going to go bowling. I think there's got to be some 24 hour lanes open. And, uh, man, we will see you guys next time. Sign up to the Patreon, sign up to the discord, chat with us. Most fun on the discord is fight day, fight day. You start the, the rumblings come on early and people, ah, oh, what about this pick? And what do we think about this guy? And who's going to this and who's going to that? And, uh, uh, you know, as the fights are going on and, and people are winning money and losing money and yelling and loving and hating. And I, I just think it's a lot of fun. So you guys, if you're a lot of you are already on the discord, we'll see you.